Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, August 7, 2022. It focuses on praying for believers, for the church. The message to all who will listen is believers need prayer, and we can effectively pray for them if we seek guidance from God's Word and from the Spirit. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. Let's pray together, and then we are going to learn today how we can pray for each other. And I hope that God's word will encourage you as we do that. God, thank you that you are here and that you are ready to speak to us, that your word is capable of changing our hearts as your spirit does his work. And God, thank you that you want us to understand. And I pray, God, that the word would come alive that we would be changed and transformed and given knowledge of what we need to do this week. I pray that you do your work in your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Every month, Evangelical Friends Mission, our church's gospel-sending organization, publishes a prayer letter. And some of you probably get a copy of this, either by email or some of you get it in the mail. We often print the front page of it and put it on the bulletin board so that you can catch the short stories of what God is doing in different places throughout the world. It's posted on the Friends Mission website. It's all over the place. If you don't know how to pray for missionaries, it's because you're not looking, because they have put out as much as they can. So on that prayer letter, after that first page of brief stories and reports from the missionaries, on the remaining pages, the newsletter shares how numerous workers are giving thanks to God, the things that they're praising him for, praising him for what he's done and what he's doing, and also they give out specific requests for prayer for the needs that they have. One of the families that we support Brad and Chelsea Carpenter, a couple who are working with the Friends Church in Rwanda, Africa, were among those who are featured this month, August 2022, in the newsletter. And so these are the things that the Carpenters are giving thanks for. They said, we're thankful for EFM short-term missionary Thomas Moore coming to be with us. So there's a short-term missionary that's spending some time with them. We're thankful for a gradual lifting of COVID-19 restrictions and how that allows us to be able to meet with people and do trainings in person. And then finally, they're thankful for some wonderful time with Chelsea's family who was able to come and visit. And I'm friends with Chelsea on Facebook, so I saw the pictures for mom and dad and her brother and several others that came to spend time with her. Everybody's smiling, they're having a great time. Can you imagine if you haven't seen your family for months and months and months, although I suppose they have communication means, but they're there in person sitting in your living room? Woo! That's pretty exciting, and I'm glad that they had that time together. And then after giving thanks, These are the things that this couple has asked us to join them in praying about, and after I read this, we're going to do that. We're going to pray for them. So here it is. For the upcoming Luke 10 trips to Tanzania in September and South Sudan in October, those are the trips where we're working with EFM to start five new fields and and send 10 new missionary units out by 2025. That's only two or three years from now, and so all these trips are going to different places, and Brad is going to be a part of those trips. Those are coming up very soon, so we're going to pray for that. And then they also ask for prayer for God to increase the passion of the Burundi, Rwanda, and Congo Friends churches, and to raise up people from those churches to be sent and to send people from those churches as missionaries. And then finally, they said, for the team that's coming to visit in early August, made up of people who sense God may be calling them to be missionaries, and for wisdom and discernment for all involved in those trips. So let's just go ahead and pray for those things. It makes sense that we read the requests and we pray about them, right? Put it right into practice. So God, thank you for Brad and Chelsea and for what you are doing through the church in Rwanda where they serve. We pray for Brad as he's preparing for these Luke 10 trips to Tanzania and South Sudan. I pray your blessing upon him and on every other member of that team, including those from Burundi and Rwanda and possibly from Congo. And I pray, God, that among the friends in those three African countries that you would 
raise up people to send missionaries and raise up people to be missionaries in these places, places where they have much more cultural affinity than anybody here from the United States. But I pray that you'd put together the right team to send to each of these places and help us to discern which fields you're sending us to and that the harvest would be ripe and that you would compel people to go. And we're thankful for what you're already doing. We also pray for those who are considering a call as missionaries and who are going to be visiting Rwanda in August this month. And I pray, God, that you would bless them as they're together with Brad and Chelsea, as they're experiencing the mission field, that you would draw people to Christ through them and confirm the call that you have on their life. I pray, God, for your blessing on this, and we thank you for the opportunity we have together to pray for Brad and Chelsea and the work that you're doing in Rwanda. Blessings on their church, upon the church, the Friends Church, and all those who lift up Jesus in that country. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it great to know what our friends need from God and to be able to pray? And ask him to do those things. If you aren't already getting the newsletter, you can get it. We can talk about how to do that after our service. Or you can contact me later this week. So last time I taught you, I talked about how to pray for unbelieving friends. Do you remember the ways that God's word suggested that we pray for the lost? If not, we're going to review. We can pray that the devil's blinders would be removed. Remember, the devil blinds people so that they can't see the light of the gospel of Christ or understand that. So we're going to ask that God would take those blinders off so that they can see. We're going to pray that God's word would take root, that nothing would distract them, that the devil wouldn't snatch God's word away. We're going to pray that workers, that's us, that workers would be sent out into the harvest field Pray that our friends would be convinced of their need of the Savior, that they'd be convicted as far as sin and judgment and righteousness, and that they would repent, turning away from their sin and turning to God for salvation. Those are the things we're praying. Are you praying those things for one or two friends? I hope you are. Encourage you to keep doing that. Have you expressed God's love to them in a practical way? Remember, the goal is to to add kindness to our prayers and action to our prayers. So that's what we're after. After I preached last time, we had this treasure chest put back up here. If you have a piece of paper, you can write somebody's name on there, and you can put it in that box. If you aren't here today and are watching online, you can send a piece of paper or stop by sometime this week, and we'll get that in there. It's just a physical reminder of what's important, of what we're pursuing. We want people to come and know Christ. So... Grab a pencil, write it on a piece of paper. If you already have that paper, we're going to try to get that back there to the back of the church today so that you can drop your name in there. And remember to pray for them. We want people to be blessed. So I want you to look around you for a second. I want you to do two things. First, I want you to imagine the friends that you're praying for seated with you in worship. Can you imagine this place crowded with rescued sinners? We're already full of rescued sinners here, but more rescued sinners. Can you imagine anything better than that? I don't think I can think of anything that would be better than that. So I want you to picture it, and I want you to imagine a worshiping throng, and it's awesome what God's doing. Second, see who is here. Think about those who are normally here who may be missing today. I'm not talking about numbers here. I'm talking about individuals. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ who have been adopted into God's family. Men and women who want what you want and desire for God to bring their friends to salvation. They're in love with Jesus and seeking to follow him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they need prayer too. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah, you know that they need prayer because you need prayer. Sometimes you find it hard to follow Jesus. You fall for the enemy's temptations and fall into sin once in a while. You get distracted by the worries of this world. You get burned out when you lean too hard on your own strength, forgetting to rely on God's. You let fear keep you from doing good things and from sharing the good news. We all need prayer. At the end of his words about spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says this to the church. I'm reading verse 18. Actually, let's read it together. And here's Paul's directions to the church. Let's read that together. 
and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You and I, the Lord's people, are called by God through this word from him to pray and 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 pray. You get the idea. For God's people, always keep on praying. That's what he says. The people that you saw as you were looking around earlier, those are among the people that you're always to keep on praying for. They're among those who are under enemy attack day after day who need God's help in their struggles against the enemy. They're the ones who need courage to do what's right and godly as they seek to make disciples of Jesus. We get newsletters from missionaries. We talked about that so that we know what's going on with them. We know how to pray for them. They give us specific requests. What about the rest of our believing friends? They don't have newsletters, right? I don't get newsletters from any of you, not normally anyway. But uh, (laughs) sometimes they tell us what they need prayer for, but not always. And so we need guidance on how to pray for our believing friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. I want us to see what wisdom we can find from the Bible to direct our prayers for each other. Earlier in Ephesians, we were just talking about chapter 6. We're going back to chapter 1 now. Paul writes out his prayers for the church. He tells them how he's praying for them. He does it twice, in fact. Once in chapter 1 and a second time in chapter 3. And these prayers are going to be our focus this morning. They're going to guide us into praying effectively for our Christ-following brothers and sisters. Sound like fun? I hope that you're encouraged. So let's listen as we go to this first of these prayers. We're going to be reading Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 23. I want you to hear how Paul prays for the church. And this is a model for how we also can pray for the church. And you understand the church is not a building. That's just a meeting place, right? We are the church, believers in Christ. So let's listen to how Paul prays for the church. Starting at verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 1 says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, that is Christ's, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I love how Paul begins this prayer. He begins it with thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God for the faith of the people to whom he's writing. He's thankful for their faith in Jesus, and he's thankful for their love for God's people, for each other. These two things are among the things that we ought to pray for each other, for every believer. Both those we know and those who we don't, those who worship here and those who worship in other places who honor Jesus. We can... As we give thanks to God for fellow Christians, pray that their faith in Jesus would grow stronger over time. And that their trust in him would not falter when things fall apart. We can ask God to stir up faith in them as they pray for the lost and over the events that are taking place in their lives. Pray that God would stir up faith. God, help your church to grow in faith. Isn't that what we desire? We want our church to grow in faith and each individual to learn how to act out their trust in him. We can also, with thanksgiving, pray that the love that believers have for each other would remain steadfast. Jesus said something important about the love that his followers would have for each other in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. 
I want you to listen as Jesus, who is our master, speaks to his closest friends, the disciples. He's speaking to them, and he wants them to understand how important this love that they have for each other is. So here's what it says, John 13, 34 to 35. It says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How many times did he say love in there? How many times did he say that it's directed at one another, at each other? This is true for the church. He was talking to the 12, but he's talking to us through them. We cannot expect the world to take Jesus seriously or even be curious about the church if all we do is bicker and spew hateful, spiteful, nasty words. Whether it's at them or at each other, especially if it's at each other, who wants to be a part of that? Not one person. No one is attracted to a group that is hateful and spiteful and bickering. I don't want to be a part of it, do you? No. We must truly and practically love one another, sharing in each other's needs. We must take Jesus seriously. Paul's words urge us to give thanks for the love that we see and ask for it to grow stronger and deeper in every one of our brothers and sisters' lives, in their hearts, and that it would show in the way that they act toward others. God, help us to love. Help your church to be the most loving group of people that anybody in this community knows. That when they look at us, they know that the Father sent Jesus. God help us. Amen? So even when we disagree with others, perhaps especially when we disagree with them, love has to prevail. I'm not saying we compromise the truth. I'm saying that we speak the truth when we speak it in love and we act lovingly, never being harsh or angry or whatever. We're speaking the truth in love so that people will come to know Christ and come into his family. All right, the next thing that Paul asks is that every believer would be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they may know God better. That's the purpose. I think we forget far too often how amazing it is that we can know God. You and I can relate to and talk with and hear from the one who made us. The one who made everything. The Almighty. The one who's both over all and intimate with those who put their faith in him. We forget that. We think sometimes or we feel sometimes that he's distant and aloof, but he's close and intimate. He's with us. That's what Jesus came to be, Emmanuel, God with us. And he's even more intimate than he was with the disciples at the time that he was walking this earth because he's in us. His life is within us. We are close to him, and he's in relationship with us. And here's the thing. The better you know him, the better you'll be. You'll treat me better if you know him better. I'll treat you better if I know him better. You'll act more righteously. I'll act more righteously. You'll hate sin and avoid it more. My life with you will be better because you know God better, and your life with God will be better because I know God better. Yours will be better because of my closeness with him and vice versa. I think it wise to pray that through the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts, Every believer might know God better and better and better day after day after day. Knowing God will make each person's life better and make mine better and make the church's impact on the world greater if we know God. I mean, like talking with him, listening to him, paying attention to him, doing what he gives us to do in each moment. God, help us. Help my believing friends to have a greater knowledge of you day after day, moment after moment. Help us to know you and to allow your life to show through us. Amen. Next, Paul prays that the eyes of each believer's heart may be enlightened in order that they may know the hope to which God has called them. He wants every member of the church to know the riches of God's glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. He wants us to know that good stuff's coming 
We're going to inherit good things when we die and when we're with Jesus and with the Father forever. But we also have power to live for him now. You and I likely don't think about what's coming nearly enough. And I'm not just talking about heaven, about the good things that God's going to do in our life. We think of heaven as a place that we go when we die. We suppose it'll probably be, ah, nice enough. (laughs) But we tend to think far more about the concerns of our day-to-day experience here and now and completely forget that something's coming that's going to be beyond our imagination. We're going to spend eternity with God face to face. It shouldn't be this way. Our eyes should often feast on the riches of what is to come. Paul calls these things a glorious inheritance. Glorious is not a word you use for nice enough stuff. The word implies surpassing greatness. What we will possess for eternity is not a trifle. God will dwell with us, and we will be his children and be in his presence The very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, begins with the description of Eden restored, the curse reversed, access to the tree of life granted, bearing fruit every month, every month, every month. We get to eat of the tree of life that only Adam and Eve had access to before the fall. Listen to Revelation Chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. We're on the very last page of your Bible. I'd almost guarantee it. You might have an extra page. I don't know. But we're right there at the back. I want you to see if our inheritance is not more glorious than anything that we strive to possess in our fallen world. Better than cars and boats and TVs and houses and green grass, if anybody has any left. Better than anything we could possess. Here's what it says, Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And this is just one small picture of what's coming, one small picture of our glorious inheritance. Remember in the garden, Adam and Eve had fellowship with God. They walked with him in the cool of the evening. They delighted in him, and he delighted in them. There was no sin to mar their relationship with one another or between them and God. There was no shame. (laughs) Can you imagine that? Won't that be great? No more shame. All these things are given as a gift to those whose faith is in Jesus in the coming days and for now, if we listen to the Spirit. And the truth he speaks to us through his word. We don't have to live in shame anymore because the shame of sin has been taken away. The power of sin has been taken away. The guilt of sin has been taken away. Woohoo! <laughs> God, give us a clearer vision of the glorious inheritance we have, the inheritance that's coming, and the inheritance that we have now, the life that we have now through the Spirit of God. God, help us to pursue you more than the shallow things of this world. The rest of this first prayer is a reminder of the greatness of Jesus. He is far above all power and authority. He has a name that's above every name. There is no one greater than the one who came to save us. He is the loving head of the church to whom we bow in worship and in obedience. There's no specific request for prayer or call to prayer in these final verses of Ephesians 1, but I think we can extend our prayers for opened eyes to ask for a reverence and submission to the Lord. God, help your church to see your son for who he is and to submit to him in all things. He's got the authority, not me, right? He's got the authority, not you. 
Let's move on now into the prayer which closes out chapter 3 of Ephesians. It begins at verse 14 and runs through verse 21. I know it's going to be an encouragement to you as we read, so let's hear what Paul has to say here. Starting verse 14, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God." Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Isn't this a great prayer? Paul prays for the church, focusing on the things that matter far more than the mundane things of this earth. It's about becoming who God wants us to be. Paul prays for the church, for each member of the body of believers in Ephesus, that they would receive God's strength in their inner being. Strength that matters comes from the Holy Spirit. Not from mustering a bit of gumption, not from pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, not by lifting weights or exercising. Strength that matters comes from God. It's God who makes us strong. So ask God for his strength in your innermost being, in the innermost places, but also ask him to give strength to your close friends in the faith. Pray that they would grow in their confidence in God's goodness and trust him to help them when they feel weak, useless, unworthy, all those things and lies that the devil tries to throw at them. When life falls short of their expectations, may they cling to a God that they know and that they would receive his strength. Paul says some interesting things about weakness in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read a little bit of it. You're going to find a few words about what God does with weakness in 2 Corinthians 12. Listen to what they are, what Paul says. They're important. These are found in 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 10. Actually, I'll start partway through verse 5. And here's what it says. I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I will not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. Now, there's all sorts of things in this passage that we could talk about, that thorn in the flesh from Satan and all that kind of stuff, but that's not our focus today. Our focus is on what he says about weaknesses, and the last sentence of that kind of sums it up. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. (laughs) When we are weak, we become more desperate for God. We turn to him with more energy. We plead our case. We ask for bigger things because we know that we can't do them ourselves. So pray for your friends that God would strengthen them in their inner being so that he can be seen in them, be glorified in what they do despite their failings. See what God can do. That's what we want people to see is what God can do, not what we can do. God, give our friend, your church, true strength in their inner being so that they can live a life that points others to you. Isn't that what we want? The second part of Paul's Ephesians 3 prayer is vital for us as believers. We need to grasp how far beyond any other love we've ever known is God's love for us. 
Your parents love you. Or they did while they were alive. God loves you more than your mom or more than your dad ever did. Your kids love you, or they loved you while they were living. God loves you more than any son or daughter could. He loves you even more than that best-behaved kid. Your spouse loves you, or they loved you every day that they drew breath. God loves you more than any wife or husband ever could. God loves you. I was listening to a podcast earlier this month. This guy was speaking about God's love for us, and he suggested a simple exercise after talking about how many people aren't really sure about God's love. They doubt his love. And he asked those in that shaking and unstable boat to do this, to say out loud, God, you love me, and to say it to him. In our worship songs, often we say, I love you, Lord, you're worthy of worship, and all that kind of stuff, and sometimes we forget that God loves us. We don't really experience that. We dare not forget that God wants to be in relationship with us, and that the relationship between God and man is two-way, that we love God and he loves us. And whose love's greater? God's. Would you try out my podcasting friends exercise with me? On the count of three, we're just going to say, God, you love me. And I want you to say it to him, not to me. We're going to worship God. So one, two, three. God, you love me. I hope that you experience God's love, that you believe that because it's true. God, help your church, each individual in your church to understand how wide and deep and vast and awesome your love is for them, far beyond anything that they imagine. Amen. There's so much in these two prayers that we've looked at today. There's more than we've even discussed in depth. There are words of praise for Jesus, things said about him which we ought to dwell on. Maybe you can go back and look at those things. There are things said of the church which we dare not forget. We are the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So he's filling the earth, but he's also filling the earth through us so that people can see him and see how he loves them. That's what Paul wrote in chapter 1, verse 23. We too are the ones through whom God displays his power, bringing glory to himself in every new generation. We saw that at the end of chapter 3. The passages that we've read today are so powerful. They are encouraging to me. They make me thankful for God and for his people and give me insight into God's desires for me and for each person in his church. They show us together how to pray for each other, how I can pray for you and how you can pray for me, and we can pray for our brothers and sisters in other churches too, right? We're not in competition. Sometimes we get that mistaken identity like, oh, we are in competition for the, with that other church because we're better for sure. Nah, <laughs> we're not in competition with those who name the name of Jesus in truth. God wants strong faith and deep love. He wants us to know him better and better. He wants us to set our hearts on the hope that we have and to remember our glorious inheritance. He wants us to submit to and obey Jesus' authority and receive God's strength and to fully grasp and enjoy the amazing love that God has for us. As we close, I invite you to turn to one of these passages that we've talked about today, either Ephesians 1, 15, to 23 or Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 and read God's words again during our time of silent worship. Let God prompt prayers for one or more believers that you know, men and women whose faith may be faltering. Pray for those who struggle to grasp God's love. Pray that a good friend would know God better. So let's do that. Whatever prayers God prompts now or throughout this week, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. God, I know that 
Many believers have heard the lies of the enemy, sometimes spoken through others, through their parents or teachers or people who are just mad at them. They feel weak and worthless because of that. I pray, God, that today, through your word, you would do in them what you desire to do. And that is for them to understand the depth and length and immense quality of your love for them. Thank you that the only truth that matters is the, the truth that your spirit speaks to us through your word. God, help us to live in the love that you have for us. Help us to experience and to know it. And God, strengthen us in our inner being to do what you've given us to do. And God, I pray that you'd strengthen our faith and our love for each other, that the world would see your church and know that you are real and can make a difference in people's lives. And I pray, God, that throughout this week we'd have opportunities to speak your truth in love and that you would give us opportunities to be kind to those around us, those who are praying for it. And God, I pray that you would draw people to your son, Jesus. God, we're praying for your work to be done. And we want to be a part of your kingdom and a part of your harvest working team and your disciple making team. Help us, God, to follow you this week pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.